All right. Well, kia ora, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this session, and I would like to do so by starting in the language of my Fano, meaning my family from Aotearoa, which is also known as New Zealand. Kia ora koutou koutoa, no mai haere mai, mai ahi ahi marie. I'm going to introduce myself now using a pepiha, which is how we introduce ourselves in Maori culture. Ko Taranaki te monga, ko Uranui te awa, ko Tokomaru te waka, ko te atiawa te iwi, ko waka totara te, te tupuna, ko kura tutu rahanapaki toku kuya. Ko Douglas Mason Duane, Toku Papa. Ko Jennifer Duane, Aho, Senior Program Analyst at the CFPB. No rera tena kotu, tena kotu, tena kotu katoa. So I'm wondering if you'd like me to translate that into English quickly. Um, somebody's typing, so I'll wait to see if anybody says no. So what I did was uh, in in our um, in our culture, we always introduce ourselves starting with our mountain, which is our uh, Taranaki, which I introduced myself Taranaki Temonga, and then by our Awa, our river or the water nearest us, which the river was Uranui in my Fano, and then by the Waka, the canoe or Waka that brought us to the land. Tokumaru is the canoe of my, or the waka of my ancestors. And Te Iwi is the tribe of New Zealand. We're made up of many, many tribes in Aotearoa. And my uh, tribe is Te Atiawa. And then the uh, my Tupuna is my ancestors. And my great-great-grandfather was Waka Totara, which is, again, Waka's boat in Totara, is uh, is a tree. It's a giant uh, white pine tree. And then uh, my kuya is my great-great-grandmother, um, who is the daughter of Wakatotora, and her name was Kurututu Araihanapaki of the Te Atiawa Iwi. My father was Douglas Mason Duane, Toku Papa, and me, Jennifer Duane Aho. And no rera tenakotu, tenakotu, tenakotu katoa is Hello and welcome to you all. So quickly about the Bureau, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. The Bureau, um, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is dedicated to making sure you are treated fairly by banks or financial institutions, depository institutions, lenders and other financial institutions. At the Office for Older Americans, we focus on issues of importance for those age 62 and older, we also place a special importance um, on those who are caregivers, family caregivers, financial caregivers, and others who um, provide care and or concern or a circle of support to older people. At the Office for Older Americans, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> at the law also mandates that we collaborate with others in the aging field, such as health and human services and all of you. It is our goal to protect older consumers from financial harm and to help them navigate key financial moments as they grow older. We also identify and address emerging consumer protection risks and coordinate our efforts with federal agencies and state regulators to promote consistent, effective, and efficient enforcement of consumer laws. Um, so before uh, we go on, I just wanted to thank our Mana Wahini, uh, Cynthia LeCount, for joining us here today. We've known each other for quite some time, and I'm just thrilled you could be here today, Cynthia. And all of our Kaikoro Ahure, our distinguished speakers, for taking the time to prepare and share their presentations with us today. Namihi nui ki a kotu katoa. That's thank you all. Thank you all very much. I honor the tremendous work you all do. He mihi waka manawa atu ki a kotu. And in closing, we look forward to working with you all to build collaboration and response to the needs of the older people 
that you serve, the Kuya and the Komatua, to keep them safe from elder abuse and from financial harm. Maori ora. Cynthia? Thank you, Jennifer. Can you hear me okay, everyone? Yay. Did I make it in? Um, thank you very much, Jennifer. And I appreciate your continued work with tribal programs. And I always loved listening to your introductions and your stories. So thank you. And Bill Benson, I think you're out there somewhere. Um, thank you for pulling this together, Peggy, Joe, and Bill. I'm, I'm very excited that this discussion today, this event is occurring. You know, in 1985, we first started talking about, or formally, about elder abuse in Indian country. 1985. Look how long ago that is. 48 years ago. Um, or no, isn't it? 38 years ago. But it's been a long time to get to the where we are now with actually having a few dollars to get to award, having some, having Congress um, acknowledge our need, certainly working with the rest of ACL and all the other HHS agencies and those who are, who are working with Bill Benson and, and Title VI programs. We're very, very grateful. I want to tell you a quick little story about financial abuse in Indian country from someone that I helped um, in the last week. A grandma who was is 72 years old and had been paying her grandson's insurance, not willingly, for about five years. And his girlfriend's policy was added on. And anytime grandma would mention it, he would get angry and yell and break connections. And then he got a DUI and the same thing happened. So this grandma was really struggling with that, what was happening in that relationship. So I was able to provide some assistance and she did go to the bank to stop payments, any future payments on that insurance. Financial abuse is everywhere. We always hear the same kind of stories, the pressure that family members or community members puts on an elder and um, the fear of not retaliation, but the fear of losing our family members. So um, I also wanted to mention, please interrupt. Um, for at least interrupt me, but please make sure your questions are, are heard, whether you're on the chat or you get a chance to ask a question or make a comment about your own program. I know that Jennifer and Bill and Peggy Jo really want that to happen. This is an interactive discussion. And um, I'm just glad this is, you're talking about this, Bill. You know, sometimes we think that oh, tribes are really poor people and, and we don't have very much and we all live together and so what's mine is theirs and what's theirs is mine, but the sometimes theirs doesn't ever become mine and our elders truly do become abused. So thank you, Bill Benson, for bringing this topic forward and run with it, everyone. I don't know what I do now to quit this. Thank you so much, Cynthia. And... Uh... <laughs> Thank we you. will now proceed and uh, get into our agenda for today. So we'll be starting with an overview of elder financial exploitation and then continuing to talk about elder financial exploitation specifically in native communities and including considering risk factors related to EFE in native communi communities. We'll then have a number of presentations on different resources and from the National Center on, for Victims of Crime, from the CFPB, from the Native American Elder Justice Initiative, you'll hear about a, a range of resources that cover different facets of combating elder financial exploitation in Native communities. And then we'll have time for questions and answers and proceed to the closing. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers for you today. Judith Kozlowski, uh, an elder justice consultant, will be talking about elder financial exploitation and what the data shows related to that subject. We have Sean Spruce, 
from First Nations Development Institute. And Sean will be talking about elder financial exploitation as it's observed and seen in Native communities specifically. We have Alicia Nebakaya from the National Center for Victims of Crime to present that, uh, that center's great resources and array of uh, materials. We have Lisa Schifferly, Senior Policy Analyst at the Office for Older Americans at the CFPB to talk about the range of CFPB resources that are available on this issue. And we have Peggy Jo Archer and Bill Benson, both from the Native American Elder Justice Initiative. And Peggy Jo will be talking about uh, the that initiative's array of resources and Bill Benson will moderate our question and answer portion of today's webinar. At this point, I'd like to invite Judith Kozlowski to talk to us about elder financial exploitation and provide that overview. Judith. Okay, thank you. And now my mic is unmuted. Um, it seems a good idea, I think, to ha have an overview of uh, elder financial exploitation um, and, and some of the other forms of elder abuse as well, because as we get into this, uh, the subject more deeply, I think it's important to have um, some kind of, uh, of construct. So what is elder abuse? Uh, it is an intentional act or a failure to act. And sometimes we, forgot, we forget that second part of the definition. And that failure to act or intentional acts that causes or creates a risk of harm to an older adult. And that is someone, at least in, in our statutes as we have them at the moment, who is 60, to 60 years or older. And the abuse can occur at the hands of a caregiver or person the elder trusts. And that includes not only family, but uh, trusted neighbors, other people that that person engages with regularly, as well as people who gain trust through um, third party contacts, as, as we'll hear, particularly on some of the scams to be discussed this afternoon, particularly the grandparent scam is a good one. So these are some of the types of elder abuse, uh, physical abuse, emotional, financial, which we'll focus on today, sexual abuse, and neglect. Neglect can also be the neglect of a person who is a caregiver or self-neglect. The data shows that at least 10% of elders suffer some form of abuse during their lifetime. And if you add financial abuse or exploitation to that, it's nearly 20% of our elders. One thing I'd like you to all remember and something I've learned is true is that poly victimization generally is part of uh, an elder abuse uh, picture. If a person is a victim of financial exploitation or financial abuse, that person is often a victim of other types of elder abuse. They often occur at the same time. There has been a couple of studies that show that financial um, abuse can uh, occur independent of those other uh, types of abuse, but generally it has been found, I believe in you know, over 85% of the cases that there is a co-existing uh, abuse that's going on either at the same time or preceded it or followed it. And one of the biggest risks for elder abuse, including financial exploitation, those risks are social isolation, being cut off from family, being cut off from um, uh, community in some way, and then cognitive impairment of some sort. Here's some of the things to think about too. Financial abuse and exploitation is the largest growing cohort of all cases that we see in elder abuse. Over 11,000 people turn 65 every day. 20% of our population will be over 65 in 2025, just two years from now. And over 10 million Native Americans, Alaska Natives and Hawaiian elders are over the age of 65 now. That means that number will continue to grow as the population continues to age. The scope of financial exploitation has been very difficult to ascertain because there's very little data, but some of the cases, some of the research that has been done has shown that only one in 44 cases of financial exploitation is ever reported or recorded. And I would guess that maybe even lower 
I mean, or the number may be lower than that for tribal communities, meaning that it's very seldom uh, reported because many of the cases have to do with family members. The range that has been estimated of the losses suffered by older Americans is somewhere between 2 billion, the lowest number of an older study, and a more recent study that shows it uh, could be over 38 billion. And that number has been supported by some government uh, studies that have been recently done. I urge everyone I talk to to try to find out the cost of financial exploitation in their area, be it in their state or their city, so that we can, as a group, learn more about the impact of financial exploitation on federal and state programs, to be able to understand the impact of uh, certain uh, programs that may also be interventions to help stop that. Some of the states that have looked at this more closely are Utah, New York, Maine, Wyoming, and Oregon, and Montana may be beginning a similar study soon. Financial exploitation or abuse usually breaks down into three separate categories. One, third party schemes. Those are all the things we've heard about, mass marketing schemes, sweetheart schemes we'll talk about today, uh, lotteries, foreign lotteries, investment scams, penny stock scams, uh, real estate, and some of the other ones might be home repair scams, again, uh, sweetheart scams, grandparent scams, tech support scams, government scams, and, and corporate scams of some sort. Um, just remember, you know, the IRS is not going to give you a phone call, and uh, nor is uh, nor is any other government agency. Another another group of uh, exploiters tend to be trusted parties. These are people that an older adult knows. It could be a banker, a lawyer, accountant, an investment advisor, a broker, a doctor, neighbors, friendly neighbors, not so friendly neighbors. Uh, tax preparers, hairdressers, caregivers, um, and often there are affinity scams, which I think will be spoken about a little bit later today, uh, where you're focusing specifically on a particular group of individuals who may have common purpose, may have common custom, may have common religion, may have some other uh, common um, notion that brings them together in community. Sometimes uh, there have, and I, I know I have done with several cases where there have been religious leaders who have not been um, have been interested in only exploiting the people that have been part of their congregations. And then um, there is the other group of cases or, or perpetrators tend to be family members. The numbers in some studies have been as high as 70% of the uh, financial exploitation cases are by family. Um, this is heartbreaking, I think, in every way we can think of, because it talks to, to the same issues that Cynthia mentioned this morning, as, as, rather this afternoon when she was doing her introduction. Um, I think we have seen this in just about every every cohort and every group of individuals that I've ever spoken with. I, I think the fact that if we think of family as community and that we share so much within families also leaves us vulnerable to being taken advantage of in, in those families. It's one of the things that um, I know the a presentation I gave at several Title VI conferences was uh, I called it first of the month because it's when all the benefits come in and that's when the family members that you may or may not know you have show up and that's when uh, the older adult is often extremely vulnerable to uh, exploitation. It's always important to remember, I think, that when we talk about third-party scams, the stuff that gets lots and lots of of press and lots of attention is just a small fraction, really. It's about 20% of all of the financial exploitation. It rests mainly in people who are trusted by the elder adult and family members. And always looking in these two cohorts of trusted parties and family members to see what other types of abuse may be ongoing at the same time in order to make the individual more vulnerable to financial um, exploitation. Here's some of the consequences of financial exploitation. There are certainly the obvious financial um, consequences, which could result in, in poverty and homelessness at its worst. Uh, there are health consequences, which I think you know, many of us have seen where an individual cannot or has to choose between uh, medicine and food because there's not enough money. Uh, the, the actual stress of financial um, uh, 
stressors, the possible hospitalization, and mortality and suicide, which has increased quite a bit. There's one significant study that shows that victims of financial exploitation and abuse have a 300% greater chance of mortality. Some of the psychological impacts are also uh, fear of the loss of independence, the fear of relationship disruptions. It could be with family, could be with friends, the deep shame that is often felt by an, an individual who's a victim and the fear, and the, also the fact that it changes all their plans for the future. They don't see the future in quite the same way. Some of the other consequences, of course, um, fall on families. The financial support that may have been there may disappear. There may be a loss of the transfer of, of wealth. And thinking about that can be just a, a family treasures. It doesn't have to be tons of money. It can be all of the things that matter in a family. And again, the cost to society. Those are the things I was talking about earlier. What is the cost in public programs that is impacted by financial exploitation? So these are some of the vulnerabilities. I think most everyone probably recognizes them, but um, over time, adults become much less risk averse. Uh, this is part of normal aging. It isn't necessarily a, 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 a part of dementia or, or diminished capacity in any way. Part of, um, there have been some interesting studies where an older adults in their you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s have the same impulsivity, impulsivity as uh, people in their 20s and uh, late teens, early to middle uh, 20s, somewhere along there. So um, hold that thought when you're talking to older adults, because it may not be dementia, it may just be that we're just plain old risk averse. Also, one of the factors of vault are not risk averse. Um, factors uh, affecting vulnerability are also, of course, brain diseases, different types of dementia. Alzheimer's can affect decision making and behaviors as well, and so does trauma and dementia. And sometimes in discussing uh, issues or particularly financial exploitation, because it can be such a closed topic with those who've been affected, there is some confusion sometimes where trauma and dementia are seen as the same thing, and they're not. And I think it's important to be important, careful in, their, in questioning to understand the person in front of you, whether you're, the person is talking to you from a trauma perspective or from one with uh, a diminished capacity. There are also physical impairments, eyesight, hearing, mobility, chronic health conditions, could be other things that will also impact that person's vulnerability and make them more vulnerable uh, to financial exploitation and to other types of abuse. And of course, there are psychological impairments, loneliness, social isolation, as we discussed, and certainly we've learned a lot about loneliness in the last three years, and also the dependence on others uh, for activities of daily living. Sometimes that dependency can cause a vulnerability um, in the fact that the person feels weakened in some way because of the need for that dependency, and sometimes the person providing that care can take advantage of an elder adult. So why are these cases hard to do? I think we all have experienced that we, we have a good idea. It is, it, the bottom line is it's the breach of a long-standing trust. An older adult has trusted a person in some form or fashion and when that trust is broken, um, that is shattering often. There's a desire often to protect or shield or help the perpetrator, especially in family cases. Sometimes the victim is afraid that something may happen and that person would have to leave their home. There's a belief that someone else knew what to do and they were so much smarter and could do it so much better. Another reason why the cases can be complex is that a person may have some sort of uh, deterioration in health and it can be, as we know, can be, become very sudden. There's also, this goes back to some of the sweetheart scams and others of belief in a short-term romantic relationship. And the other is just suffering from some sort of cognitive impairment. And this can happen at a different time of day. There's a person, you know, often older adults have sundowning um, as, as uh, an occurrence and their cognition is not the same as it is in the morning, making a person in the afternoon generally more vulnerable. So these are some of the forums for resolution, and I think we'll be talking much more about this this afternoon, and I won't go into any great detail, but there are administrative forums where there can be some sort of dispute resolution. There can be um, some sort of arbitration. You can go through the tribal courts, which in many cases do a, a, a terrific job of dealing with families particularly and figuring out good solutions. 
that doesn't work. There are civil courts and there are uh, last resort criminal courts to, to deal with these cases. There's much more to talk about. I'm really looking forward to hearing everyone. I, um, I think that uh, we have a wonderful lineup this afternoon. So uh, thank you very much for your time. And I'd like to turn it over now to Sean Spruce, who will give us a much more uh, complete view of uh, financial exploitation in Indian country. Thank you. Well, thank you for that handoff. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up. Okay, great. All right. So I'm a, a consultant and I work with First Nations Development Institute. We're a, a native-led nonprofit that's based in Longmont, Colorado, with also a field office in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And fraud awareness, financial exploitation, and specifically working with elder populations is a very, very big focus of the work that we do. And I've been out in the field now for close to 15 years doing presentations, doing workshops, uh, writing materials as well, all geared around protecting folks from financial exploitation. And originally when I got into this line of work, I was really focused more on just teaching financial skills, you know, teaching people how to create budgets and how to understand their credit reports and basic investing. And then when I started working more closely with the FINRA Investor Education Foundation, it uh, dawned on me very quickly that we can teach financial skills all day long, but if somebody can just come along and exploit those skills and take advantage of us and steal from us uh, great budgeting skills and uh, understanding wants and needs and goal setting, all that stuff just, just goes away if somebody can exploit us. So unfortunately, we see our tribal communities exploited in many different ways. And, and a lot of it has to do with technology and just the way that uh, people can can take advantage of us. They can contact us in, in ways like never before. Traditionally, our communities can often be more remote. They can be rural. But now somebody on the other side of the world with a smartphone is able to contact us, an elder perhaps, and exploit us financially. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and talk a little bit about some of the risk factors that our elders in our populations face. And of course, during COVID, when so many of us were isolated, it really hit our elders hard. And as many of you know, our, our Native communities were hit especially hard with COVID, with uh, the number of sicknesses and the deaths and the losses. So elders that were isolated already, and then when COVID hit, it just made it that much worse. And one of the things we know is that isolation and loneliness are risk factors for fraud and for financial exploitation because people who are, are lonely, they're often more susceptible to engaging with somebody who might contact them via the internet or some other method. We know that now loneliness has become a public health crisis. And there's statistics out there that loneliness can be worse than smoking in some ways with regard to the impact that it has on our health. And also, we have to understand that as we get older, often many of us will kind of revert back to a childhood type of innocence. And any of you who interact with elders, you'll know sometimes just communicating with elders. Uh, they're wonderful people and they're great wealths of knowledge and experience, but uh, sometimes they can be like what we would describe as being naive or just not very worldly in terms of when a bad actor might present themselves. And some of that has to do with just how we think and how our mindsets change as we get older and we can be more open-minded, we can be less suspicious, and a lot of times that's what makes our elders such cherished members of our society is their kindness and their warmth. But sadly, they can also be taken advantage of in that way. And what I'm going to do here is just share a few different slides in terms of some of the different types of, of fraud and types of financial exploitation that we see our native care, our elders targeted with. And uh, I am having a little bit of trouble here advancing slides at this point. Let's see. just want to make sure that I have this all squared away. Okay, here we go. So these are just some different types of scams or different types of exploitation that elders in our communities might be presented with. And I think we've all seen this type of email before, right? This, this prince or this government diplomat from some foreign country who has this huge, vast fortune and out of all the 
umpteen billion people in the world, they target us. They target our grandparents or our aunts and uncles with this uh, financial opportunity. They describe it. But if you look a little bit more closely, and these are notorious because they've got bad spelling and they've got grammatical errors, but let's go ahead and advance this slide. Thank you, Ben. And let's look a little bit more closely at this bank transfer. We'll take a look at that number. The last time I checked, uh, most numbers don't have two decimal points. And anytime you have a decimal point at the beginning of a number, we're talking about a pretty small number. So here is this sum of 0 0.11. 300. I don't even know what that number is. But what's frightening about these emails is a lot of times you look at these and think, oh, geez, who would fall for this? You know, it's obviously somebody from some foreign country that's orchestrating this scam. But what our research tells us is that oftentimes these emails like this, they're intentionally written this way. They're intentionally written with decimal points in the wrong locations, with bad grammar, with bad spelling, because they've learned that if these are written too well and they look too real, they will be simply inundated with people wanting more information and they're overwhelmed. They can't manage it. So they intentionally write them this way so that only potentially the most, the, the person that's the most easy to victimize will actually respond and they can interact with. So there's a lot more thought and strategy that goes into these types of emails than a person might ordinarily think. Next slide, please. This is an email, uh, excuse me, a text message. And technically, it's illegal to solicit on mobile devices, but it happens all the time. This is an actual text message that I got a few years ago. Not sure how they got my information. But again, here you see the poorly worded email, the misspelled word, a period there where it shouldn't be. And uh, an elder might be prone to respond to this, somebody who's not particularly tech savvy, somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience using a phone. I have an aunt right now who's in her in her early 90s, and she really struggles using mobile technology. And every time I, I, I work with her and I, I see her, I'm always a little bit worried about, you know, how well she's able to manage these devices and how well she's able to respond to them. Next slide, please. There is a national do not call registry, and I always encourage people to, to register on that. But unfortunately, it's it's not a cure-all. It's just a, a database. It's just a long list of numbers that solicitors aren't supposed to call. And ideally, if enough complaints come in for a specific number, it could trigger an FTC investigation. But unfortunately, it's not like this magic device that blocks numbers or anything like that. So I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding with regard to the national do not call registry. So I always encourage elders and everybody else to get one of the call blocking apps or something like that on a phone. A lot of phones now are automatically installed with those. So those are really helpful. I want to share another scam, and this is specifically targeted at, at several Native American people that I worked with a few years ago. And it's a, it's a play on the old IRS scam, right? You get the spoofed Washington, D.C. number. But instead of the caller identifying themselves as an agent of the Internal Revenue Service and claiming there's a back tax issue or something like this, this person has claimed that they represent the U.S. Treasury, and they're informing the, the, the person on the other end of the line that they've got these special grants that are only available to Native American recipients. And, and right away, people get very curious because the caller obviously knows that these are Native American people that they're reaching out to. They understand that these people live in a Native community, and apparently they have these grants that are available to Native people. Now, the catch is that there's a fee, there's a cost to accessing the grant. And, and the two people that I worked with uh, were both encouraged to pay that fee using iTunes credits. And in both cases, uh, the people went ahead and, and provided those those credits. They One person, the, the caller stayed on the line while that person drove down to a local convenience store and purchased some iTunes cards and then scratched off the numbers and provided those those uh, those actual numbers to access the funds in those in those cards to that person over the phone. Uh, we also hear about cryptocurrencies and things like that being used as payment. But again, just like the IRS scam, an, uh, a federal agent isn't going to just randomly contact you. And if they are, if they are offering grants, they're obviously not going to require payment. 
But again, you catch somebody at the right time in the right place and they're a little bit disoriented or they're not quite thinking clearly. It is so easy, so easy to take advantage of somebody. And uh, oftentimes we, you know, we worry so much about our elderly population, but anybody can be a victim of a scam like this. If the timing is right, if they catch you at a point where you're emotionally vulnerable, maybe you're lonely, maybe you're sad, maybe you're sick. Some of these factors that could influence elderly people can certainly be exploited by bad actors. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next slide here. And the romance scam, we're all familiar with this, right? How it works. And unfortunately, Elderly people are looking for love just like everybody else and can potentially be victimized in these types of scams, right? Everybody's looking for that for that person in their life or that special event or something. They've all got we've all got that hope, perhaps. And what a lot of these scams are designed to do is play into those vulnerabilities, play into those hopes, play into those expectations. And I worked with a woman in Gallup, New Mexico, an uh, elderly woman who was cleaned out of her entire savings in her bank account, which was about $15,000. And it was through one of these Lothario-based romance scams. So these continually hit the top of the, the list in terms of the most widely used types of scams, imposter scams, sometimes they're referred to. But they're, they're very prevalent in our Native communities as well. Let's go ahead and look at the next slide. Uh, the inheritance scam, and I, I dealt with a, an individual in Oklahoma. And <clears throat> this was an interesting case. What happened was is this uh, and he was not an elder, but he had an, an elderly uncle who passed away. And about a month after the funeral, he was contacted by somebody who claimed to be a representative of that late uncle's estate. And he said, you know, your uncle had a will and you're listed in the will and you're set to receive a pretty sizable inheritance. Well, everything kind of worked out. The numbers all jibed. And it turns out I think this uncle did own like a business. So he did have means. So it all kind of fit. But of course, the catch was. In order to, to get this inheritance, in order to gain access to it, you need to complete some, some paperwork, you need to file some forms, and there's a cost to that. And unfortunately, this person sent about $5,000 to this individual who claimed to be an attorney hoping to access this, uh, this inheritance, and it was all a scam. There was never any follow-through. There was never any money, never any contact, again, from this so-called attorney once that payment was made. But again, these people are targeting native communities and they're paying attention. And because of the internet, because of social media, because so much information is online, obituaries online, bad actors can get so much information from us. And for our elderly folk that might not be as, as tech savvy as we would hope that they could be, or might not have the same understanding of how to use social media and such, unfortunately, we're seeing more and more that they're being targeted and taken advantage of. Next slide, please. Uh, other types of risks that we really need to pay attention to, even just basic mail security, you know, making sure a mailbox is secure. It's a locked post office box. We need to really be careful about putting mail or payments or bills that we're paying, checks and things like that into a, an unsecure mailbox. I always encourage folks, especially our elderly folk, if you use a mailbox, make sure that it is well locked. Ideally have a post office box at the, at the post office. And if you're making payments by checks, because we know even though the trend is less and less check writing, uh, in our elderly populations, we still have a lot of folks that are writing checks and you hear about check washing scams and things like that. So really important. If you're going to pay by check, go to the post office, put that check, put that payment in the actual slot there. So it's secured as opposed to just putting it in an unattended mailbox or leaving it at your mailbox at your house for a postal carrier to pick up. Also, um, during the holidays, you know, one of the big scams is people will just drive around neighborhoods and communities looking for delivered items from Amazon, from FedEx, from UPS, right? And in the old days, when I, I remember, whenever they would leave a package, they'd have you sign for it. But I think now they're just so inundated. We do so much e-commerce that these delivery drivers just throw stuff on the porch and they take off. So there's people that will drive around and just looking for deliveries and waiting for those deliveries to be, to be delivered. And they'll grab those products or those boxes and take off. So those are just some other examples uh, of things we need to be on the lookout for, and especially our elderly folk could be at risk for. Uh, the picture there, that's from Gallup, New Mexico. This this one's been around forever, right? The $20 ribeyes or the 20 ribeyes for $25. And this isn't necessarily fraud. I mean, these are actual steaks. You can buy them, but they're just not always the best option for somebody, right? They're sometimes, I mean, I remember as a kid, we bought those one time and they just, they had a lot of fat and they just, 
pretty much disintegrated in the pan. So little issues like that as well, these are, can all be different ways that, that our elderly folk can be taken advantage of financially and exploited. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so I just want to share some closing resources. Again, I want to be mindful of our time here. We've got other presenters, but I represent First Nations Development Institute, and we've got a wide range of resources that are designed to promote financial education as well as exploitation and fraud awareness. And we do create materials specifically for our elderly population. We have a program called Investing for the Future that uh, provides basic investing information and also fraud awareness tools and strategies. And I also write a monthly financial column. It's called Ask Dr. Percap. It's kind of like a Dear Abby for Native American people with questions about finance. And I usually write four of these a month. I distribute them once a month. So ideally, people can publish those once a week. And it's free content. You just copy and paste these into tribal newsletters, uh, websites, tribal papers, whatever you I would just ask that you, you you do give credit to First Nations Development Institute and the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. And many of them are lighthearted. They're written from a Native American standpoint. Some of them are humorous. But a lot of these issues, a lot of these topics that we're talking about today, I'll address in the Ask Dr. Percap series, uh, how to protect yourself from identity theft, uh, how to avoid check washing scams. Uh, just lots of good information in a Native American context. And then also our close partner, the FINRA Investor Education Foundation. They've got a lot of good resources as well at the FINRA Foundation website. They also have the brokercheck.finra.org website for anybody who's looking to work with a financial advisor. They can check that person's background because, again, our elderly people can often be exploited with investment type scams. So that's a good resource. And then we also have a co-published document called New Money Coming into Indian Country. And it deals specifically with some of the challenges that our tribal communities face in regard to lump sum payments. They could be from per capita distributions. They could be from settlements and some of these recent court judgments, such as the Code Bell settlement a few years ago, that creates windfall payments in, in some tribal communities. And sadly, if folks don't have some skills with regard to handling a lump sum, uh, they can definitely be targeted by bad actors looking to take advantage and financially exploit them as well. So I think that's my last slide I just wanted to share. So again, my name is Sean Spruce, and I represent First Nations Development Institute. And uh, I want to go ahead and turn it over to the next presenter. These are just a few of the resources that we offer to help combat financial exploitation amongst the elderly in our communities, Native communities. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sean. Really appreciate that. Hello, friends. My name is Alicia Navakoya. I want to introduce, I'm coming from the Southern Plains of Oklahoma on the Muskogee uh, Reservation in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I want to introduce you to uh, the National Center for Victims of Crime, which is a national nonprofit organization. <clears throat> The mission of the National Center for Victims of Crime is to forge a national commitment to help victims of crime rebuild their lives. We are dedicated to individuals, families, and community by crime. I am the Senior Program Specialist for Tribal Affairs here. And as we begin this presentation, I want to thank our partners and CFPB for putting together this very important webinar on how to protect one of Indian country's most valuable resources, and that's our tribal elders. As we know in Indian country, tribal elders are the backbone of our communities, that they are respected, honored, and cherished in all aspects of everyday life. And while we love and respect and revere them so much, unfortunately, and too often, they are also victims of crime. Our elders can be abused in a variety of ways from sexual abuse, physical abuse, mental abuse, abandonment, spiritual abuse, and financial abuse, which is, you know, obviously the topic of our discussion today. I want to, to put this out there. If at any time you feel that your elder is in an, in an unsafe or violent situation or is in imminent danger, call 911 immediately and report it, no matter who the perpetrator is. So what is financial abuse of an elder? Financial abuse occurs when someone takes or misuses another person's money or property for the benefit of someone other than that person. For example, neighbors, caregivers, professionals, and even family or friends may take money without permission, 
in tribal communities. They can take jewelry, spiritual and cultural items. They can ask for land, trust or restricted land. Their IIM, Indian individual Indian money account money, medi even their medications, natural resource checks, leasing checks. There are a lot of different can happen. And this is all abuse. And unfortunately, it's becoming more common in Native American communities. And as tribal people, we have an obligation and a responsibility to one another and uh, to protect each other and to ensure that everyone is safe, especially our elders who are in a very vulnerable situation and very vulnerable time in their lives. They love us. They trust us. And um, they want us to take care of us. And we certainly want to take care of them. I'm quoting now from a great publication from DHHS that has some risk factors that are, um, are characteristics of elder financial exploitation or the character an elder might be in um, if they uh, uh, um, might get um, abused. Poor health, a mental decline, physical illness or disability. Elders may need assistance with daily living activities, such as shopping or preparing meals, managing money, and even their fiscal or financial affairs. Oftentimes, our elders have a lack of social support and are socially isolated, and they may live semi-independently with caregivers that come in and out of their houses. Sometimes our tribal elders have cultural values and obligations to share resources with the family, and that may make an elder feel obligated to give too much money. We really want to protect our elders and uh, their security wherever we can. So who's doing this type of elder exploitation? We live in a society today where scams are everyday occurrences. When you get a phone call on your cell phone, it warns you immediately. Hey, this may be a scam call. A scam is coming through. You get false advertising and scams in your mailbox every day. It is pervasive and we have to be smart about what is happening and alert and educate our communities about scams and how they harm. So scammers come in two main forms, one being strangers, people on the phone, on the internet, on email, on Facebook or social media, and through mailings in our mailboxes. These are people we have never met before. And very unfortunately, it could be from our own caregivers, families, and friends who are caring for and around our elders every day. I call these people tricksters. So in a stranger situation, these are the scams that are perpetrated by people that we don't know in our communities. These folks are reaching out, trying to get your money in their pocket. If someone asks you for money, beware. That should raise an automatic red flag in your head. And um, if, if you're talking to them on the phone or whatever means you're communicating with them, try to distance yourself from any sort of emotional event they're bringing you to um, and start to think more critically. Just calm down and really um, trust your instincts. If you can do this, we can maybe stop a, tr a scam in its tracks. So as, as you've heard just a little bit earlier, grandparent scams are one of those very emotional scams um, that try to get grandparents' money from their pocket into, from a grandparent's pocket into the scammer's pocket. And grandparent scams occur when fraudsters pose as family members in danger and persuade elderly victims to pay bogus fees, fines, or ransoms. And here's how a grandparent scam typically works. So I'm going to give you an example from the Choctaw Reservation. Pokani is an 82-year-old grandmother living on the Choctaw Res. She was working on a basket when her phone rang. On the other end, her grandson was in tears. He said he'd been in a car accident and needed $2,000 to cover his release. He then handed the phone over to a tribal public defender. Bogany was told that someone would come pick up the money in cash and then her grandson would be free to go. But when she called her grandson later, she realized it was all a scam. And unfortunately, grandparent scams like this one are getting more common and more common in Native America. 
Latest data from federal agency agencies shows that in 2022, nearly half a million seniors were victims of fraud, losing $1,000 to $1,800 on average. So the way scammers attack is they contact elderly victims, usually over the phone. Next, they make up elaborate stories and claim they're in trouble. The scammers quickly pass the conversation over to a third party. And in order to protect the family member in trouble, the victim will be required to pay money. This scenario is happening and it is unacceptable to our elders and we got to stop it. The other type of fraudster is a caregiver, a fa family member or friend, people that our elders know and interact with every day. And unfortunately today, caregivers, um, hospice workers and and family members have unlimited access to elders, their financial services, checks, checkbooks, their homes, their jewelry, cultural items, valuables, and other items of private value to our elders. And too often, uh, when an elder is being abused financially, other forms of abuse come along with it, like emotional, physical, sexual abuse, threatening behavior, abandonment, and even violence. I'm going to tell you a story from my own family when this happened. Um, in my family, my elder cousin was being physically and financial abu financially abused by her grandson. This was uh, her son, basically. It was a child that she had raised uh, from a toddler. He often took money from her and wanted money and items of value from her, the car, the truck, money for gas. The unfortunate outcome was that she had to report the issues to the police after he strangled her and almost killed her after she had refused to give him any money. She had to have a protective order issued by a court and she stayed away from him for five years while the court stay uh, was in, in effect. But unfortunately, she passed away during this protective order stay and never saw her grandson again. And this is a very harsh reality that exists in some aspects of tribal life, and it really hurts. It damages and it traumatizes, but it happens pretty often. As her family member, we had no idea that this was going on until the court issued the protective order and the grandson was in trouble with the law. I personally really wish that we had uh, known more and been in closer contact with her to know this was going on, we could have intervened uh, and done something to prevent this. Family exploitation of tribal elders is perhaps one of the most difficult parts of tribal life. These are issues that get complicated. People get angry. People believe that they are being wrongly accused and react sometimes even violently to the person accusing of financial fraud if it does get reported at all. So often it doesn't get reported. Next slide, please. So I wanna draw your attention to this painting. In this painting, it's called Camp Crier's Warning. And the artist depicts a tribal camp crier moving from camp to camp, delivering the news to our villages. Um, the news could be something joyful or something ominous that was coming. Camp criers were used to alert our tribal communities that they were moving camp soon, hunting season was going to begin, a ceremony was coming, and even that the enemy was near. The camp crier would go through the camp and instruct people on what was going to take place and how to do it and even when. In a similar way, I think we are all here to give the latest news to our tribal community that an enemy is near and we must protect our people and stand our ground. So how do we do that? One, we must return to our traditional values. We must respect our elders and instill that respect in our communities. Let our communities know that our elders are valuable connections to our past, to our future, and to us personally. They are not to be used, abused, Are thrown away. Two values of right and wrong in our families. All teaching comes from our family first. Teach integrity, model integrity in all of our transactions. 
And at the tribal government level, we have to educate our elders, our caregivers, and our folks that these issues are real and can cause great instability to our tribes if left alone. Three, intervene. Become aware of the interactions between elder family members and caregivers. Uh, if elder abuse or exploitation is discovered in family, talk about it. Talk about it. Have a family intervention. Ask folks to stop exploiting or abusing and let the trickster know that you know and that you are watching what's going on. If after that intervention doesn't help matters uh, or an elder is in imminent harm, report the transactions to the police immediately. Make sure that your elder is safe. This is the most important thing. If you are a tribe or tribal government, make sure that your elder codes and elder services are up to date and can handle the abuse charges, allegations, and crimes that take place on the reservation. Five, contact the tribe for rehabilitation counseling services. Um, and six, look to your peacemaking courts, your tribal justice system uh, for peacemaking opportunities to make victims and perpetrators whole again using tribal law, cultural values, and norms. Peacemaking courts are often led by respected members of the tribe and are not necessarily led by a judge. Peacemaking allows for all parties to come together, discuss problems, voice their perspectives and concerns, and eventually come to a resolution. Last slide, please. Unfortunately, no segment of our society is immune to crime and violence, and that is true of Native American society as well. American Indians and Alaska Natives have the highest crime victimization rates in the nation, but often have difficulty and often have uh, difficulty connecting with the services that exist to help victims and survivors recover. At the National Center for Victims of Crime, we do have a tribal resource tool, which is a web-based resource uh, created to provide a listing of available services in your area and identify gaps in victim services so those uh, issues can be addressed. You just go to our website, click on the map, and find and um, your area should populate services that are uh, available to you. And with that, I really want to thank you for your time today. It's been an honor uh, to highlight these issues uh, with you. And I look forward to uh, hearing more from Thank you, Alicia. Next, we'd like to invite Lisa Shipperly from the CFPB to talk to us about financial caregivers, grandparent scams, and more. Lisa. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Schifferly, and I'm a senior policy analyst in the CFPB's Office for Older Americans. I'm going to share with you some of our tools to help with some of the issues that you just heard about, family exploitation of tribal elders, as well as grandparent scams. So when we had a listening session earlier this year with people who worked with Native communities, we heard that these were two of the biggest concerns, family exploitation of elders, as well as grandparent scams. So this piece here called Considering a Financial Caregiver, Know Your Options, it's a pretty new piece that we have. And we'd like to offer it all to you all. It's free and can be ordered at consumerfinance.gov slash msem or consumerfinance.gov slash order to hand out in your communities. And by choosing a financial caregiver carefully and the right type of caregiving arrangement, it may help some people be less likely to get into that type of family exploitation situation. So this piece is designed for someone who's early in the caregiving process. Maybe they're just starting to notice that a loved one needs help managing their finances, or maybe they're planning ahead for their own financial future. What this does is it goes over some informal caregiving options, as well as formal caregiving options, and also gives some questions to consider when trying to pick who's the best person to take on this role. So first it goes over informal caregivers. And this can be just someone who helps out on an as-needed basis. It includes conversation partners, trusted contacts, and convenience accounts. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those. A conversation partner is really just someone you give who's a trusted relative, friend, or professional, 
you give them an overview of your finances and you can share as much or as little as you want. Uh, you're not giving up any control. You might just, for example, ask a broker or banker to send a copy of bank statements to a child, an adult child, or ask a trusted friend or relative to join you when you visit your bank. This is just a first initial step and it is still even at this initial step, very important to choose wisely who you let know anything about your financial information. And we'll go over some more questions about that in a minute. Another thing that people can do if they need help with their finances is set up what's called a trusted contact person. And this is someone that you can put on an investment account or some bank accounts offer it as well. Sometimes they call it an emergency contact. It basically just allows the financial institution to contact that trusted person if they see signs of exploitation. So this can be a really good safeguard for people early in the process. Maybe they don't need complete help managing their finances, but just want to flag in case something goes awry. Another option is a convenience account. Um, this names someone to help you deposit and withdraw money and write checks. It's not the same as a joint account where the money is jointly owned and the joint account holder automatically gets the money when someone passes away. Um, so the convenience account doesn't change the ownership of the money in the account or give the helper the right to keep the money when the elder dies. So this can be a good option for people. People often default to joint accounts uh, but our piece wants to remind people about convenience accounts if that might be a good option for them. The piece also talks about formal caregivers. The options I just described are informal caregivers who maybe someone just needs help from time to time, but there are some people who then need more than just occasional help and it might be time to name a formal caregiver in a legally binding arrangement. So. The guide goes over power of attorney, guardian, trustee, and uh, government fiduciary options. And I'll talk about each of those in a second. But first, I want to talk about what is perhaps the most important part, which is how do you figure out who's the person who you should choose to take on any of these roles? So our guide offers a bunch of questions to have a conversation with the elder who may be choosing a financial caregiver to think about who's the best person. Is it someone who they trust? Is it someone who will act in their best interest and who will listen to them? Also to think about some of the hard questions, like is this someone who has a drug addiction, alcohol addiction, gambling addiction, mental health issue that might cause problems with them being your financial caregiver? Will they manage your money property carefully? And will they be able to keep good records? Those are just some of the questions to think about when choosing a financial caregiver, and this piece can help you have conversations with an elder to try to think about um, who they might want to have as a financial caregiver if they need to have one. And we also have these managing someone else's money guides. These are all also free and available at consumerfinance.gov slash order to order and give out in your community. These go over each of the formal caregiving roles that I described before, and they provide tips for people who are acting as those financial caregivers so they know what their rights and responsibilities are and can help the elder to avoid fraud and exploitation. So the first guide is about a power of attorney. If you're not familiar with the power of attorney, it's a legal document um, where somebody gives their agent power to manage their finances when they're unavailable. It can also make it easier for loved ones. Some people don't want to deal with the expense or inconvenience of going to get a power of attorney. Um, but if you think of one example from my family, um, unfortunately, my grandmother was hit by a truck and went into a coma and did not have a power of attorney. So we had to get guardianship for her, which I'll talk about in a second. But had she had a power of attorney, it would have um, saved the family a lot of time, energy, stress, money, um, because we could have just pulled out that document. Instead, we had to go through a court proceeding. So power of attorney can be a very powerful and helpful option for people to have even before they need that care, just have it in place in case you need that care in the future. Another option are representative payees or VA fiduciaries. If somebody is getting social security or veterans benefits, then these are the people who manage their benefits. They're only responsible for the government benefits, not for any other money that the 
older person has. We also have a guide on guardianships. As I mentioned before, this is someone who a court names to manage money and property for someone else, if, especially if you don't have a power of attorney already in place. Finally, there's a trustee and a guide for people who are trustees. This can allow someone to put just some of their money or property into a trust in order to um, pass on to their heirs. And now planning for diminished capacity and illness is another great resource that we have, which allows people to stay control of their finances and plan ahead if they do become ill later in life, it can do things like talk to you about how to set up trusted contacts and social security advanced designation. So those are all things for people to think about in terms of financial caregiving, especially even if you don't want to enter or the person doesn't want to enter into any of these types of legally binding relationships, the questions about who you pick for whatever type of financial caregiving the elder is comfortable with, um, those are good questions to think about to try to pick the best person to try to help avoid exploitation. Now, I also want to talk about our Money Smart for Older Adults materials. These are helpful with some of the fraud and scams you heard from our earlier speakers. You already heard from Judith about what's elder financial exploitation. So I just want to skip ahead and just mention that anyone can be the victim of financial exploitation. It can happen to anyone regardless of age, social, educational, and economic status. So nobody should feel ashamed or embarrassed if they are the victim of financial exploitation. It's a crime and um, people should view it as such. And also by talking about these fraud and scams like we're doing today, that's a great way to prevent the scams as one of the previous speaker says it's like a call to action for us to spread the word about these scams um, to fight the battle to try to keep fewer elders from losing money to them. You already heard a great uh, but sad example of a grandparent scam. So I won't go into this in too much detail except to say that this was one of the scams that was identified at our listening session as something that um, a lot of people working in tribal communities had heard elders experiencing. And of course it pulls on your heartstrings because you wanna help the grandchild. Um, but our Money Smart for Older Adults curriculum can help you teach people about it. It has an instructor guide it has a resource guide, it has PowerPoint, so you can go out there and teach people about the scam because if they recognize it, then they'll know if they get a call like this rather than rushing to get an iTunes card or rushing to get cryptocurrency or gift card, they'll think twice and say, oh wait, I heard about this. I should call or text my grandchild first before I send any money. So Money Smart for Older Adults, it was developed with the FDIC. And like I said, it has instructor guides, resource guides, and PowerPoints. Also, if you know somebody who does experience uh, fraud or identity theft, they can report it at reportfraud.ftc.gov, like an earlier speaker mentioned. If there are enough reports, then the FTC or other government agencies who have access to the database may take action to try to stop these scammers so that reports to the government can help stop scams in your own community because then people know, law enforcement agencies know where the scams are and how to shut them down so they don't hurt other people. So your money, your goals is the last thing that I just want to mention as part of this presentation. It's a great resource for anybody who does financial empowerment in the community. It has information to help people get a job, find a place to live, deal with legal problems. And your money, your goals has a toolkit. It also has companion guides. And the reason I'm really talking about it is we have a very special companion guide specifically designed for native communities that I will show you. And it also has booklets, therefore colorful booklets that can help you address things like being behind on bills, debt, credit, and savings. So these can help people of any age really. But the one that uh, focuses on Native communities, this is what 
it looks like here. This is part of the CFPB's Your Money, Your Goals series. Um, and in early 2016, representatives from a variety of different tribes and organizations gathered to reflect on the experience that leaders had in sharing the toolkit and on ways to share additional information that could assist other Native communities in implementing your money, your goals. So that included people from the Chippewa Cree tribe, the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, the Confederated Tribes of Colville, Salt St. Marie, the Seminole Tribe of Florida, the Office of the Special Trustee, and the American Indian Center at, the, at UNC Chapel Hill. So all of those people came together and helped uh, with this guide. And you'll see that what it has is it has tools for identifying elder financial exploitation. This checklist can help you in your community to go through. It can you be used one-on-one -on -one if someone expresses concerns about an elder and his or her living conditions, care, or financial situation. Responses to the question included in the checklist can help you or the individual to get assistance and to identify if this is in fact elder financial exploitation. The Your Money, Your Goals guide for native communities also has information on where to get help with elder financial exploitation. And it has information about preventing elder financial exploitation, about creating a culture that prevents exploiting elders' finances. So this tool includes strategies for communities as well as families. And on this last slide, I just want to leave you with some contact information for the CFPB. Uh, if you want to contact us, you can do so at olderamericans at cfpb.gov. There's the link for the Managing Someone Else's Money resources, and you can order any of our resources for free, including free shipping at consumerfinance.gov slash order. So we hope you will use them in your communities to try to help combat elder financial exploitation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peggy Jo Archer for our next presentation. Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here with us. There's been lots of great information shared here today. And if you're wondering now what, what do we do that we now know about financial exploitation and what it looks like um, and how to respond. So I'm going to give you a few um, resources here from the Native American Elder Justice Initiative. We are a resource center that serves Indian country on various forms of elder abuse. Um, and so we're gonna go through some of the resources that we have today. So we'll start off with elder abuse codes. I do see in the chat that somebody asked, how do we develop elder abuse codes? What are elder abuse codes? And so basically this, an elder abuse code is a legal protection. So we wanna strengthen our legal protections for elders by developing and enforcing elder abuse codes. And if you go to our website, which you'll see right here is the link is the niji.org. Um, and we are in the middle of um, rebranding and changing our URL, URL links, but still just follow this link and it'll take you to the new one. Um, you'll see on the side we have elder abuse case or elder abuse codes. So no matter what state you're in, you can go to your state and see if there's an elder abuse code in um, the certain area that you are. And that can help you see um, what is defined as elder abuse and how you can respond to it. But also, like we said in the question, somebody asked, how do we develop elder abuse codes? On our website, we have an entire toolkit that helps go over the start to finish of developing an elder abuse code. Now, it, there's about seven steps. It lays out every step exactly what you can do or what you should do, what are best practices. Um, it can look like it's overwhelming because it is a lengthy process, but we would love to be with you along that way. So please reach out to us if you are interested in developing an elder abuse code and we will be with you along the way, um, break down each section with you and help you navigate that. Here is what our website looks like. You'll see at the, stop, at the top, we have resources, we have elder abuse codes, state and tribal hotlines, trainings, um, lots of information on elder abuse. And just like um, Judith said, elder abuse and exploitation also accompanies other um, forms of abuse. So our website and information talks about all the forms of um, abuse that you will come in contact with. 
Here is the financial abuse training module. This is specific to Indian country. So I, I encourage you to take or take a look at this module. I see it best used as let's say we have um, new staff coming in or we're doing a, a training for um, staff training. This is a good 40 minute training on what financial exploitation looks like in Indian country. And we also have a fact sheet that goes along with it. So these are also free. They can be shared. They can be downloaded. Um, they can be used a variety of ways. And I encourage you to share them and use them as much as you can. Um, this is an important one that I pulled from that financial exploitation module is language while working with elders. Um, we know that there are best practices to use when working with Native elders. And it's it's not really asking them, have you been exploited financially? The best terminology to use is, have you been disrespected? Is anybody hurting you? Are you afraid of anybody? Um, is anyone taking or using your money without permission? By using this language and using these best practices, you are more apt to getting a disclosure of financial exploitation. Um, again, this is in the module of that financial exploitation module. Um, I again, highly encouraged to go and take it. There's also ways to, um, if you are caring for a Native elder and there is financial exploitation happening from a caregiver or a caregiver recognizes it, there's a lot of information in there to support all of the roles um, with when working with elders. Again, here is another one is our stay in tribal hotlines. So I know that today we learned a lot about financial exploitation. So I um, anticipate you all going out there and recognizing financial exploitation based off of what you heard today. Um, please don't feel alone and not knowing what to do when you do come across it. Let's say that you are in the state of Arizona. This is an interactive map. You can just hover over the state of Arizona. And on this, you'll see on the right hand slide, it pops up all the tribal and state hotlines um, that you can report or get res resources for abuse. Um, so I encourage you to use that as well. Um, here is that module or that fact sheet to use. It's really designed nicely um, and it's a good talking piece whenever you're going somewhere and you know that financial exploitation is going to be the topic of conversation and maybe there is not enough or any knowledge on how it is um, impacted or elder, um, elders in Indian country are impacted by financial exploitation. This is a good talking piece. So again, I encourage you to download, download it, print it, share it, use it how um, you can use it. And then here are some more um, fact sheets that, again, talk about financial exploitation. This one is labeled or um, called legal issues in Indian country, but it does have a financial exploitation aspect to it. So I also encourage if you're talking about legal issues and you know that financial exploitation is going to come up, this is also a good one. Again, another one, consent and capacity has a legal or has a financial exploitation aspect to it. This is also a really good one. And then here's kind of a basic one for elders and care, elder caregiving in Indian country. And all of these have a financial component to it. Please, again, use them as you need. And we talked about grandparents raising grandchildren. There's a lot of financial exploitation that can happen within there. So you'll see on the right, it's very small. I couldn't um, blow it up. It was blurry, but you'll see it says financial assistance and it goes in there and talks about um, financial abuse and how that can look. Again, thank you for attending today and please let us know if you have any questions. We would love to meet. Um, if you have any thoughts on um, elder abuse codes or what elder abuse is, or you need any kind of training or technical assistance, we would love to meet with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peggy Jo. And at this point, we have a minute or two. We have a couple of minutes for question and answer. And I wanted to invite Bill Benson from the Native American Elder Justice Initiative to lead that portion of our event today. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben. And uh, just a quick follow-up to Peggy Jo. Um, I'm just very uh, grateful to the Administration for Community Living and particularly Cynthia LeCount Shop for uh, having the faith in us to um, allow us to run the Native American Elder Justice Initiative Resource Center, which Peggy Jo runs. So we're thrilled to be able to work with Indian country everywhere to address this incredible topic of 
elder abuse, including financial exploitation. Uh, we have a question that we want to ask everybody to answer in the in the chat feature, meaning our audience, and that is, tell us what has been successful in your community in preventing financial exploitation, if anything. So please go ahead and answer that in the chat feature if you want. But I'd like to um, ask one question that invite any of our panelists to jump in. We don't want a free for all, so we don't have the time for more than one or two people to offer a thought. But the question that um, one of you has raised is, when a person who is being exploited does not want law enforcement involved, who else can help and respond, help end and respond to the issue? Or is law enforcement needed in all situations? So I'll, I'll invite any one of our panelists, whoever comes forward first, to offer a quick response, and then I'll, I'll add a comment to that. This is Lisa Shifferly. I can start. I mean, I think law enforcement may be needed if you want to prosecute the case, but if you don't, there certainly are other options like working with the financial institution. If there's a financial institution involved, they may be able to take steps to, you know, stop any fraudulent transfers from happening if you notify them very quickly right away. Um, there's also adult protective services. There's also elder justice professionals in the area that may be able to help depending on the type of fraud or scam. You can also report to the FTC at reportfraud.ftc.gov. And even though they can't necessarily help and assist in your particular case, it can help other people by seeing trends. And um, then the FTC may bring an action to shut down that particular fraud or scam if it's a systemic type fraud or scam rather than, you know, a family member who's exploiting you. So there are a variety of options, including government agencies, financial institutions, and others to contact in addition to law enforcement. Lisa, thank you very much for that. I was really hoping to hear some reference to adult protective services, and you did that. So thank you yep. for that. Um, before I turn it over to Jennifer Duane to close out the program, um, APS or Adult Protective Services did not come up throughout uh, this particular webinar because there was so much to cover. But Adult Protective Services is a really important resource, whether it's tribal APS or state and local APS, uh, depending on the jurisdiction and the location. So I invite all of you to learn what you can about Adult Protective Services. We are seeing um, a nice um, growth in the number of tribes that have developed or are developing adult protective services programs. Several of them are on this call as participants, including from the Tawn Odom tribe, the Quinault tribe, Regis Mohawk, uh, I believe Muckleshoot is on here as well, that have been running as well as Shoshone Bannock that run their own APS programs. And my last comment is that the administration for community living in Cynthia's shop We'll announce very soon, within the next week or so, uh, at least four, possibly five new tribal APS program grantees that they are able to fund for the first time ever because of dedicated congressional money. That is a landmark change in Indian country that we are very excited about. So I'll stop there, turn it over to Jennifer Duane to close us out. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, Cynthia, did you want to say anything before I uh, close us out? or Really nothing of substance, except this was absolutely fantastic. And thank you all the presenters for your information and sharing your knowledge today. And thank you, Bill and Peggy, for finding all of these presenters. You're bringing some new folks to our Title VI Network, and I really love that a lot. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, so this concludes our webinar today, Namihi Nui Kia Kotu Katoa, which is thank you all very, very much. And extra special <coughs> thanks to our fabulous presenters today. Um, really appreciate all the different perspectives and resources and you just brought so much to the table. And it is a, a good thing that um, this is uh, recorded. There'll be a link uh, of the recording 
for others and for yourselves if you want to refer back. Um, and also materials that will be coming out as well. So with that, um, we do have an upcoming uh, event, another webinar. We have a series of webinars, actually, that with their links. If, so, if uh, one of you wouldn't mind putting the link up to our YouTube channel um, with Elder Networks, um, on Elder Networks. But there's a, just, a I don't know, about a dozen webinars that we've put on in the last six months. So it's a great source of information on all kinds of resources and topics and, and about how to come together um, in many ways. Um, and with that, I will uh, say kia kaha, which is stand strong in Māori, and kakite, which is farewell for now.